we go from uh, Chris's points now on crowdsourcing to someone who's taking crowdsourcing to a whole new level. Zoe Conliffe is the CEO and founder of She's a Crowd and a researcher in gender and crowdsourcing technology here at Monash University in Melbourne. Zoe's work uses crowdsourcing technology to make cities safer for women and address the gender data gap. She's, She's a Crowd uses the power of storytelling to address the data gap in gender-based violence. She has been, uh, she, by she, I mean Zoe, has been named uh, one of the top 100 most influential, creative, and provocative people in Melbourne, and her company has twice been listed on the Smart Company Smart 30 list. It's very smart. Uh, please give it up for the awesome Zoe Con- My name's Zoe, and today I'm going to begin with a story. So, when I was in grade two, our class did this thing where when it was your birthday, you got to have a special show and tell. Uh, Like, more than just your average weekend, kind of what I did on the weekend. It was kind of like a TED talk, but for seven-year-olds. It was a big deal. And so, I remember my birthday was coming up, and I went home and I said to mum and dad, what should I talk about for my special show and tell? And they said, why don't you talk about when we lived in Cambodia as a family when you were younger? So I got my photos prepared, Um, I was a little bit nervous, and I stood in front of the class on a Wednesday morning, I remember it like it was yesterday, and I said, when I was little, I lived in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, on a crocodile farm. And I began to tell my story. Sit down. Don't tell lies. My teacher interrupted me. I hung my head in shame and my cheeks burned and tears rolled up in my eyes. And I sat down. And have you ever been made to feel like, you know, something you've experienced isn't normal? Because that's how I felt in that moment. And I guess I didn't tell my parents what had happened in show and tell that day for years. Because for some reason, I felt like the reason why Chantel didn't go well is, was somehow my fault. But I learned a very important lesson that day. I learned that, you know, it's probably not normal to have lived on a crocodile farm in Cambodia when you're a kid growing up in Queensland. Um, but also that if you have experienced something that's not considered normal, then it's something that you should be ashamed of. But growing up, my curiosity for Cambodia, this place that had shaped a huge part of who I was, just grew. And I learned that we'd lived there because my dad was a part of the United Nations mission to install democracy. I learned of the turmoil Cambodia was in when we lived there, um, that it was just coming out of civil war and genocide. Um, And I learned of the sacrifices that my parents made moving us there, but also leaving. I learned that we left because my friend who I went to preschool with there was abducted and shot in the leg and left on the street um, to die, and that's why we'd actually left. So I grew up with a very uh, deep understanding of my own privilege from a very young age, and I knew that I was lucky. So when I finished high school, I moved to Cambodia, and I ended up starting my first NGO, which was... uh, community development project, regenerating the arts in rural areas of Cambodia. I was on top of the world, I was studying long distance, I was running my first company, and I felt like, you know, I was kicking goals. And um, then everything changed, and I found myself in an abusive relationship. So that's not something that I thought would happen to someone like me. Like, I thought to myself, you know, I'm educated, My parents work in social justice, they told me all about this stuff. I'm liberated, I'm successful. This kind of thing doesn't happen to people like me. But it did, and I hid the fact that it was happening for a very long time because I was ashamed, just like I hid what happened in Show and Tell that day. But I realized that I was ashamed because I'd I felt like I'd allowed myself to get into that relationship and I felt like I'd stayed and I felt like that wasn't who I was. Getting out took a lot of strength 
But it also took the re like the, all of the resources that I had and the support around me that I had were integral to that. And that's when I realized, what happens to other people who don't have those supports? So that's when I decided to start telling my story. And I became an ambassador for the International Day of the Girl, and I shared my story. I stood up in a room like this um, and told my story for the first time, and I remember my dad being in the front row, tears streaming down his face, um, that he'd let that happen to his daughter. And what I noticed that first time I shared my story was that something magical happened. Other people started sharing their story. And I noticed that when I shared my story, the shame in the room just withered and died before my very eyes. And when I shared my story, I felt less alone, and so did everybody else. That's when I realized I needed to dedicate my life to addressing and ending gender-based violence. So this quote by the poet Muriel Rokessa says, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life the world would split open. And I ask, what would happen if millions did? Women have traditionally not been reported, recorded, or believed. We've remained invisible in the history books. But it's time that that changed. So I went on to work in gender advocacy and for international development agencies, and I saw firsthand how storytelling can change the hearts and minds of people in positions of power. And then I led the, Australia's first ever digital crowd mapping platform. We've collected thousands of stories of sexual assault and harassment across Australia. And then this, these stories became evidence. And I've worked with government, corporates, urban planners, universities to help them understand the problem so they can address it into the future. And then, the Me Too movement happened, and half a million of those types of stories were shared in just the first 24 hours of that movement. This created a global imperative and a push for change, and I noticed that people stopped saying to me, oh, women won't ever want to share those stories online, to asking, what can we do about this huge problem? So 96 million stories of sexual assault have been shared on Twitter in the last eight years. This is big data, but most of it is not being used to inform how we address the problem moving into the future. And we know here in Australia that nine in 10 Australian women have experienced sexual assault, sexual harassment on the street, and have had to modify their behavior as a result. And in Australia, we've already lost seven women this year to gender-based violence, and it's only February. 80% of sexual assault currently goes unreported, which means that decision makers don't have access to any of the data they need to understand the problem. And if you can't understand a problem, you can't fix it. So my company, She's a Crowd, uses crowdsource data to help decision makers understand this problem using something that women love to do, share our stories. Brene Brown says that stories are just data with soul. And I know that women are ready to share their stories and that decision makers are ready to hear them. And we heard from Chris about the data revolution. Data's the new black, everyone's talking about it. And data's just information, but in this day and age, it's being shared faster and in a more interconnected way than ever before. It's a new era. It's changing our economy, our behaviors, and our futures but we run the risk of leaving women out again, like we have in every other revolution in the past. And I'm not saying this is done deliberately. In fact, the most insidious forms of exclusion can be the worst. And one example of this is emojis, funnily enough. So I'm not sure how many of you know this, but there's a global emoji company, and they code all of the different emojis. They don't design them, they just code them. It's up to different social media companies how they interpret that code. So at the beginning, they coded everything neutrally, with no gender. So they would code it as a scientist, they coded it as a runner. The social media companies would all design those as male. So it would be a male scientist, 
a mail runner until someone called them out and now they've begun to code them differently. But what I'm saying is often we don't mean to, but when we design for the neutral, we're actually designing for the masculine. And this happens, this sometimes has much more dire consequences than emojis. So these crash test dummies, they're designed based off of the average white man. As a result, seven, women are 17% more likely to die in a car accident. And the gender data gap is behind all of this. But the internet is giving us an avenue to share our stories, and this is democratizing the female narrative. And my company, She's a Crowd, is ensuring that any woman anywhere in the world can share her story in a safe and anonymous way. And that story is geotagged and timestamped, and then aggregated for important information, such as key location hotspots and incident details. We've collected over 80,000 data points around the world so far. So story by story, we're shaping our own future and making sure we're not left out of the history books again. Technology and data represents an opportunity. And when women take the lead, we ensure that other women are not forgotten. When women are forgotten, we're injured, abused, and sometimes we die. But when we ensure that women are behind designing our cities and our economies and our futures, they design those to be better for everybody. It's 2020, and it's time we ensured that women were a part of the future. So finally, I'll just say that having the opportunity to stand here and share my story with you all this evening makes me feel powerful and visible. And that's how I want every single woman in the world to be able to feel. Thank you. <laughs>